It's good for your health, okay? <laughs> Last time I got a standing ovation from teachers, I was speaking down in England. The guy who spoke before me was the head of Ofsted, and the guy who spoke before him was Michael Gove. So it was easy for me to get a standing ovation. <laughs> um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is wellness, all right? And whenever I talk about wellness to a medical audience, they look at me as if I'm daft because they think actually wellness is not being ill, okay? They define wellness in terms of an absence of illness. And in fact, we know that's not the case. Um, the World Health Organization definition of health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of illness or infirmity. And in fact, we spend all our time worrying about the absence of illness and infirmity. The health service is dedicated to ensuring the absence of illness or infirmity. You try to prevent illness, you try to treat it, and so on. And in fact, we don't really conceptualize well how we achieve a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. What you do contributes to that. What social workers do contributes to that. What economic development does contributes to that. But they don't think of it in those terms. And I think it's quite important that we begin to understand how we create wellness and well-being as opposed to how we prevent illness. It's understandable how we think of the medical end of this as providing sort of magic bullets. Um, things like discoveries around insulin in the 1920s, children who got type 1 diabetes died. End of story. They would fall into a coma, they would go into a hospital, they'd linger for days, and then they would be dead because there was no way of treating diabetes. And then... Um, uh, Banting and Best in Toronto discovered insulin, they purified it, and all of a sudden it was curable, or at least treatable at any rate, if not curable. It was remarkable. Same with TB and streptomycin. Young people died of TB, streptomycin came along and it was curable. Things like polio. Polio has almost been eradicated from the world because of the delivery of vaccines. So this idea that, that, that medical research will come along, wave a magic wand and everything will get better has some basis in historical fact. But as we move into an era where the population is getting older, where there's problems around climate, where there's problems around mass migration of people to escaping conflict and so on, it becomes more complicated than just simply finding a drug or an operation to create well-being in the world's population. Oops, gone the wrong way. Pressed the wrong button. So, let's try and understand well-being in Scottish terms. And what I'm going to describe applies, I know, to some other countries. Um, data isn't quite portrayed in the same way, but the countries that I have been able to find data similar to Scottish, to, to the pattern of data that we see in Scotland confirms that this is what's happening in, in their country as well. <clears throat> this is what we think we know about Scotland's health. <clears throat> we are told incessantly that we, A, we're unhealthy, B, we're unhealthy because we smoke too much, we drink too much, we eat the wrong kind of food, and if only we would man up and do the right thing, everything would be okay. That's what we're told, isn't it? That's what we're led to believe. Well, in fact, only one of those statements is true, all right? And I'm afraid it's the one about the drink, okay? But we'll come back to that. This is life expectancy in 16 Western European countries going back to 1851. 160 years worth of data here. You can see for most of that time, Scottish life expectancy has been in the middle of the European average. You can see I've highlighted Portugal there because Portugal came from quite far back, and overtook Scotland a few years ago. Rest of Western Europe has done well in terms of life expectancy. Ours, in the past few decades, has flattened off a bit and has fallen behind the rest of Western Europe. 
And if you look at the rate of growth in life expectancy in the richest 20% of the population, and the rate of growth in life expectancy in the poorest 20% of the population, you can see that fundamentally Scotland's recent poor health is a reflection of the health of the poor. The gap between rich and poor that existed in the 1950s, if that had been maintained all the way up, we would be at least as good as the average Western European life expectancy and perhaps slightly better. Something has happened at the lower end of the social scale in Scotland to hold back our average, and that's not happened in other European countries. Now, what's the explanation? Well, it's not cigarettes, okay? This is smoking rates in 15-year-old teenagers amongst countries of the European region of the World Health Organization and Scottish teenagers in this study were the fifth lowest smokers in Europe. Scottish men in a study of EU countries, third lowest smokers in Europe, beaten only by Finns and Swedes. Scottish women let the chaps down a bit by being closer to the European average, but you can see we're not where we are because we have the worst smoking rates in Europe. Nor is it diet. The yellow line in this slide shows deaths before the age of 75 in men from heart disease in Finland, okay? Now, the Finns achieved a remarkable success. They convinced everyone that they had taken policy action to reduce heart disease rates. What they did in the 1960s, where you can see they had a very high heart disease mortality, they changed the way the farming industry was subsidized. They took subsidies away from dairy farmers to discourage them from producing milk, butter, cheese, cream, etc., thereby making the Finns the most miserable people in Europe. <laughs> and they gave them the subsidies back if they would switch to growing fruit and vegetables. And they made free fruit and free salads compulsory in every uh, workplace and school. And then they said, wow, aren't we clever? Look what's happened to our heart disease mortality. But in addition to Finland, that pale green line is the Scottish heart disease mortality. The Finns took radical action to change their diet. We did absolutely hee-haw to change our diet. And we got the same result. Because it wasn't the diet that was causing the problem. It was probably smoking. Since the 1960s, men in particular across Europe have given up smoking in huge numbers. And at the same time as smoking was falling, new drugs like statins that have an impact on cholesterol and inflammation and arteries and so on were coming in. And what happened was all Western countries saw the same fall in heart disease. This story appeared in the Times last week. It is absolute rubbish, okay? It is complete balderdash. That claim, poor diet is worse for health than smoking, is because a thing called the Global Burden of Disease Study, which is supported by the Gates Foundation, um, found that 10.8% 10 10 of early death was caused by dietary risk, while 10.7% was attributed to tobacco smoke. Well, there's no difference there but it takes no account of those because about 25% of the one's population smoke, but my guess is maybe 100% of the one's population eat. <laughs> so at least there's a fourfold relative risk of death associated with smoking there. But this is the kind of rubbish that we get fed people who don't understand the complexities of statistical epidemiology. So be quite cynical about these sort of claims because almost always there is an alternative explanation. So what is it that causes wellness if it's not diet, if it's not um, tobacco and so on? What has caused this decline in well-being, relative decline in well-being, particularly amongst the poor in Scotland? Well, in order to show you what's happening in Scotland, I need to teach a bit of arithmetic. Is that okay for me to teach teachers about arithmetic? Right. 
What we measure, what we, the way we plot this is to do a thing called slope index of inequality. For each five-year age band in the population, what we do is we plot mortality, and this is death rates in per 100,000 population in the richest and the poorest and the in-between quintiles of the population. We subtract the best from the worst and we divide by the mean and we come up with a single number. So we convert all the data on that graph into one number that reflects the slope of inequality in each five-year age band. We can then plot that number on a graph. And what this shows is that inequality is at its steepest in young people. It's not old people who die of heart disease and cancer where you get health inequalities. It shoots up between 10 and 15. It has its, it's at its maximum around about 25 to 30, and it starts to decline in the 40s. Inequality in health, inequality in mortality, inequality in life expectancy is at its steepest in young working age people and teenagers. And we can go further and we can look at what's driving that. If you take a particular cause of death, and this is ischemic heart disease, heart attacks, heart failure, and so on, you can plot by each five-year age band the number of deaths associated with that, subtract it from the all-cause mortality, and you can see how heart disease contributes to inequality. It does so in the elderly, and it's far less important than what's happening here. So what is happening there? What is causing that big iceberg of inequality in young working age people? Well, it's suicide, drugs, violence, accidents, alcohol. Drugs, alcohol, suicide, violence. We're not gonna fix that by reducing the saturated fat content of the diet. Okay, these are socially driven causes of premature death. It's an absence of well-being in young working age people and teenagers that's driving this pattern of premature mortality. And it's relatively recent. This is mortality in Western Europe from alcoholic liver disease. The line at the top is the highest mortality any of our 16 Western European countries reached. And for most of that period, certainly the early part of it, it was France that was at the top. The line at the bottom is the lowest mortality anyone reached. The line in the middle is the mean. And from 1950 to 1970, that was Scottish heart, uh, alcoholic liver disease mortality, one of the lowest in Western Europe. And everyone thinks Scots, oh, Scots are happy drunks, aren't they? Well, in fact, we're not. Historically, we were more abstemious than most of Western Europe. Why was that the case? <clears throat> well, if you think about the 1960s and 70s, who drank? Men drank. What did they drink? Tended to be beer. <clears throat> Where did they drink it? In the pub. And when did they drink it? At the end of the working week, Friday night when they got their wages, maybe Saturday at a football match or something. From 1970 to 1990, it went up a bit, but was still below the Western European average, but things appeared to be changing. From 1990, however, to 2005, that's what happened. A dramatic rise in mortality from alcoholic liver disease that was being produced somewhere before that rise, but round about there. So what produced the change? Well, if you think about a drinking culture now, who drinks? Everyone drinks. If you think about where they drink, where do they drink? Everywhere. What do they drink? Everything. And when do they drink it? All the time. We have a seven-day drinking culture now. The culture has shifted. And although men have come off the top, Scottish women are still, still have the highest alcoholic liver disease mortality in Western Europe. Think about it. So this has been a recent phenomenon. 
something socially happening in our society over the past few decades has produced this rapid widening of inequality in the Scottish population. So what happened in the 1950s and 60s, certainly in West Central Scotland and in Dundee, there were traditional industries that produced purpose and meaning in men's lives. If you're a welder in the shipyards that employed maybe 100,000 people in West Central Scotland, you had purpose and meaning in your life. You were a person of some stature. And then all those jobs disappeared. And at the same time as the jobs disappeared, the houses changed. Again, in West Central Scotland, tenement housing like this. This is a picture of the Gorbals, a very, now a very deprived area of, of Glasgow. But in the 18th century, what do you see here? You see houses, but particularly you see people. There's a community. The children are playing, the adults are out talking to each other. It was a community that looked after itself. And the women were the glue in that community. If a young mother was struggling about bringing up a child, there were older women there who would help her. If there was a bit of domestic violence, the men would sort it out. And then, in the 60s and 70s, that, those communities were disrupted. As well as the jobs going, everyone decided to improve the housing. And that's what we got. The communities that were tight-knit were flattened and people were moved all around the city, all around the west of Scotland. In new towns, suddenly people were given houses 30, 40 miles away from their friends. So community began to disintegrate at the same time as unemployment rose, its, rose greatly. And a couple of years ago, we spoke to a professor of public health from Australia who said, oh yeah, I recognize this. This is like the Aborigines. This is what happens when people who live in a, who are attached to a traditional culture suddenly get dislocated from it. They turn to drink, drugs, and fighting. And that's what we're seeing. So if it's an absence of wellness, if it's an absence of the things that create well-being, how do we begin to go about understanding how we, how we can regenerate that. And I want to introduce you to the term salutogenesis. This is a slide that comes from the co colleagues in the Nordic School of Public Health. S doctors talk about pathogenesis, the causes of disease. Salutogenesis means the causes of well-being. Salus was the Roman goddess of, of well-being and safety. And colleagues in, in Nordic School of Public Health have pulled together 25 different theories of what causes well-being under this umbrella term of salutogenesis. Now, I have to put my hand up and say I haven't read them all, okay? The book on ecological systems theory is still sitting beside my bed, and it will sit there for a while, I think. But if I just pick out two or three of them, they all say broadly similar things. Emily Werner was an American sociologist who studied the health of children, the well-being of children in one of the islands of the Hawaiian archipelago. It was an island that was notorious for drunkenness and violence and neglect and so on. And what she found was that 70% of the children were damaged by the society there. 30% did well. The factors that led to wellness in those children, she identified as first of all, the child's personality, optimistic, extrovert, protected them. Secondly, having at least one stable family member, even if it was a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt and not the parents, having some mentor that the children could interact with and get some good advice from was important. And thirdly, a supportive community a supportive peer group. She said if children who had those survived the unpleasantness on that island. Aaron Antonovsky, another American sociologist who studied the health of adults who as children had been in concentration camps, again discovered that 70% were damaged by their experience, but 30% survived because he, he described that as children they had acquired what he called a sense of coherence. 
a sense that the world was structured and predictable and explainable. Secondly, a feeling that they had the internal resources, the resilience, as where Emily Werner would put it, to meet the demands posed by the external world. And thirdly, that they saw those demands as challenges worthy of engagement. And Corey Keyes described flourishing, and again, he pulls a lot of this stuff together, that children flourish in life if they are satisfied that they have a purpose and some degree of mastery over their own lives, that they have a sense of personal growth, that they, they sense that they can change positively through interaction with the world. But importantly, this sense of control. They see themselves as being in charge of their own destiny. And Antonovsky made a statement which really made me sort of sit up and take note because Antonovsky said if you didn't have this global sense of engagement with the world, if you didn't have a sense that you could control it and manage it, you would experience a state of chronic stress. Now, when I read those two words, I remember vividly the moment I read them because I sat bolt upright as I was reading it because I was a surgeon in my earlier career. And a surgeon's job is to create acute stress in people. Honest. The acute stress response is the body's defense mechanism. So when you have a surgical operation, the acute stress response kicks in to repair the body. Adrenaline, cortisol are released to liberate energy. There are various proteins produced, particularly by the liver, that start the healing response. And what Antonovsky was saying here, actually, if you have a disordered, chaotic childhood, you switch on the stress response permanently. And I thought, wow, that might explain the link between physical ill health and social circumstances. That might explain why poverty and chaos in childhood leads to increased risk of all sorts of things in adulthood. So we started to look for evidence that he was right, and he was. This is cortisol level, the, the hormone that we use to measure how switched on the stress response is in babies and young children in orphanages. It's Canadian data. And what they found was that the longer a child was in an orphanage, the higher its salivary cortisol was. Something stressful to a child from not having a single significant adult to interact with. This is data from the civil service, 30,000 civil servants in the UK. Each day, it's a daytime cortisol profile. Each day when you wake up, your cortisol level's high and it gradually comes down and is at its lowest just before you go to bed at night. What this slide shows was that higher grade civil servants, the purple line, had significantly lower, grades, lower cortisol levels than lower grade civil servants throughout the day. The higher you are in an occupational hierarchy, the less stressed you are. The least stressed person in any government department is the permanent secretary. Okay? And he used to love it when I told him that. Um, why is that? Why is the boss less stressed than the person at the bottom end of the scale? Because he's the boss. You know why he should be? Well, it's because he's the boss. If a minister asks a permanent secretary to do something he doesn't fancy doing, what does he do? Gives it to somebody else to do. And it gradually goes down the hierarchy until in the Scottish government all the, all the rubbish that no one else wants to do eventually lands on the desk of the chief medical officer who's completely stressed all the time. Control is a big driver of this elevated stress response. And even at whole country level, you can see that same pattern. Ten years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Martin Bobak from London went round countries of the former Soviet Union and asked a lot of people in each country, how much control do you feel you have over your life? Russians reported the lowest level of control. They had the highest mortality. Poles and Czechs, highest level of control, lowest mortality. At the extreme ends of the Scottish spectrum, mortality is somewhere similar to the Baltic states. 
How much control do you feel you have over your life if you don't have a job, if your children are threatened by drug pushers, if there's concern over benefits and all this kind of stuff? Other people control your life. And that gap has probably been due to an increasing lack of sense of control across the most deprived parts of Scotland. So what's the mechanism? My view was always that I couldn't persuade ministers to change policy unless I had hard science to explain to them what was happening here. Just to say, well, chaos makes us stressed. Yeah, okay, but you know, shouldn't you just man up and not be stressed? Well, actually, there are very precise biological mechanisms underpinning this. And the best way I've got of explaining those is to describe to you an experiment I saw in the psychology department of a university in New York. And the experiment they did was they made baby monkeys depressed, okay? That's not a happy baby monkey, all right? What they did in this experiment was they changed the feeding pattern of the babies. One half of the animal house, mum had food lying out just next to where she was playing with the babies. So if the baby was hungry, she would reach over and feed the baby. The other half of the animal house, they took the food away. They took it a long distance away. So when baby was hungry, mum had to go and forage for it and she'd fight with other mums to get it and so on. So she was away from the babies for a long time and she was stressed by the experience. And then they measured the stress hormone levels in the babies in the two groups. So if I were to ask you, which group of babies do you think was more stressed? Was it the one where mum was always there or the one where mum was away for a lot of the time and was unable to, and was herself hassled by the experience, okay? Which group do you think of babies do you think was more likely to be stressed? And every time I ask that question, I can always spot the working mums in the room. Well, ladies, don't worry. There was no difference in stress hormone levels between the two groups. <laughs> These are stress hormone levels. These are stress hormone levels where mum found it easy to feed the babies. These are stress hormone levels where mum found it hard to feed the babies. No difference. But these are stress hormone levels where they randomly changed the feeding pattern from one day to the next. It wasn't mum being there or mum not being there that caused the problem. It was the baby not knowing what was happening. And if you think about it, what's the first stress a baby feels when he's born? Hunger. So what happens? He cries. So how does mum respond? She picks him up, cuddles him, talks to him, feeds him. Stress disappears. By the time that tennis match Forgive me for mentioning the tennis. <laughs> By the time that tennis match occurs 500, 1,000 times, baby knows that if he feels stress, all he has to do is crying. This mug comes along and fixes it. The world is structured and predictable, and he's in control. And the brain patterns are being laid down. The cell connections are being laid down that allow him to recognize that. Contrast that to the experience of a baby who, when he cries, sometimes gets fed, but sometimes he doesn't because mum's drunk or under the influence of heroin. And maybe mum's boyfriend picks him up and slaps him and shakes him to get him to stop crying because he doesn't know how to handle a, a crying baby. Baby learns the world is dangerous and he activates the stress responses because they are important for survival in a dangerous environment. What happens thereafter is what school teachers are presented with because that differential brain pattern is important in th at least three areas. Two bits of the brain don't develop in babies who experience chaotic infancy and one bit of the brain becomes more active when they experience chaos. The two bits of the brain that don't develop of the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. The prefrontal cortex is important for behavior. Prefrontal cortex is a bit of the brain that allows you to take new information in, process it, and decide how to act. It's the bit of the brain that allows you to see the world as structured and predictable and explainable. 
That doesn't develop such dense connections where babies experience chaotic childhoods. The hippocampus is the bit of the brain that's important for learning. But it's also the bit of the brain that has the highest concentration of cortisol receptors. It's the bit of the brain that suppresses the cortisol response when you're stressed. And if it doesn't develop those cortisol receptors, you cannot switch off so effectively the stress response. So these children become stressed, less well able to learn, and less well able to suppress inappropriate behavior in new social settings. But you add into that the third bit of the brain that becomes more, more active, that's the amygdala, and that's the bit of the brain that's associated with emotional arousal. So as well as not being able to work out how to behave in a new social setting, as well as not being able to learn so effectively, these children are more anxious, aggressive, fearful. They're on an emotional hair trigger. Do you recognize anyone from that? This is what teachers are seeing out there. And in fact, we didn't just take all this research evidence, we looked at it in affluent and deprived Scots. We scanned brains. We measured the volume of the hippocampus in about 70 Scots. And indeed, the lower down the social scale you go, the lower the hippocampal volume, the lower the white cell density in the prefrontal cortex. This is what's actually out there. So we've got a link a neurological link between chaos in early life and poor outcome. And we see this, co big cohort studies from all over the world are showing the same thing. The Dunedin cohort was a thousand children identified in the South Island of New Zealand in the early 70s. A subgroup of them were identified at age three as living in chaotic circumstances. By aged 40, they were more likely to be unemployed, more likely to have criminal convictions, especially for violence, the amygdala being uh, more active in the prefrontal cortex, less well able to suppress the aggression, more likely to have had a teenage pregnancy, more likely to be substance abusers, and they were beginning to show evidence of increased risk of diabetes and heart disease compared to those that came, were brought up in normal circumstances. Skip over that. An American study, uh, the Adverse Childhood Events Study, carried out in California, 17,000 middle-class Californians, because they were all members of a particular healthcare system, which meant they were all, none of them were at the poor end of the spectrum. But they asked these people about the prevalence of nine different types of adverse event in their early lives. Three different types of abuse, two different types of neglect, four types of sort of parental absence for one reason or another. And what they found was that the more of those adverse events a child had in his life, the more likely he was to have one of these adverse outcomes. For example, a child who had four or more adverse events in his life was about eight times more likely to become an alcoholic, about 11 times more likely to abuse narcotics. Boys who experienced physical violence at the hands of a, an older male were about eight times more likely to beat up their partners when they grew up, four times more likely to be arrested for carrying weapons. Drugs, alcohol, suicide, violence. The fruits of a chaotic childhood. This is the pattern of increased risk of heart disease, cancer, mental health problems, alcohol, suicide, and so on, in the Adverse Childhood Events Study, that's the pattern of the same problems in Glasgow. The chaos that we've seen over the past few decades is having its impact on the well-being, the absence of wellness of the population. And this costs a hell of a lot. Study carried out in the States on the costs of adversity in childhood showed that in one year, the burden on the American taxpayer was about $124 billion, equivalent to the total cost of type 2 diabetes. All we hear is, oh gosh, you know, we must fix diabetes and so on. Actually, 
if you fixed adversity in childhood, you would go a long way towards preventing diabetes as well. Win-win. So the focus has to be on providing that kind of safe, sustainable childhood. The final bit of the jigsaw here, though, the bit by which the hippocampus fails to make the cortisol receptors is now known. This is the molecular biology of a hug. This is what happens when you hug a child. It's probably what happens when you hug me, but I guess that might depend on who's doing the hugging. Okay. <laughs> when a child feels happy and contented, he releases a neurotransmitter in the brain called 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin. 5-HT circulates in the bloodstream. It's picked up by a transport mechanism on the cell wall and carried into this nucleus of the cell, the brain cell. This is chromosome number five. This is a gene which is activated by 5-HT when it binds to it. And that gene codes for the cortisol receptor. If you hug children, if you comfort children, that allows them to make the mechanism they need to suppress the stress response. So how many teachers in Scotland do you think hug the kids in their classes? Well, I have to tell you, my daughter, who's now doing a modern languages degree at Oxford, spent a year before she went there um, teaching in a school in Spain. Every morning, the six-year-old children would come in, line up, they'd give her a hug, and they'd kiss her on both cheeks. It's a cultural thing. We're frightened to hug children. In fact, lots of these kids really need hugs. And I think this is really stupid, this attitude that we've got, and is damaging the kids, and we should try and do something to change it. There are other things you can do to repair the damage done in early life. There is a panel, um, Bruce McEwen, a colleague who, who's done a lot of the neurobiology in, in these, these uh, children. Bruce says, the three things that they have found that, is, uh, that are important in reversing the damage caused in childhood, reversing the damage in adult. First of all, physical activity. Increasing brain blood flow produces new cells in the brain. Secondly, mindfulness seems to be an evidence-based approach. And mindfulness, we know that mindfulness enhances activation of the prefrontal cortex and decreases activation of the amygdala. That's exactly what we want to do. And the third element that they are deciding is important in reversing some of the damage is to provide a safe and secure and supportive social network for kids in these difficulties. So the mechanism, the way in which we create well-being is we feel well when we know we can handle events, events that causes stress and tension. We feel content that we can resolve those feelings. We are in control. And we're in control because we have this, we see the world as a coherent and predictable and manageable place. But in addition to that, Externally, we need a whole load of resources to support that resilience. We're always tested beyond our experience, whether through bereavement, loss of a job, some kind of accident or whatever. And in those circumstances, we need the support of family. We need the security that comes from being successful in education, work that gives us material resources, a sense of cultural stability, a stable set of answers in life. The kids that don't have that will struggle when tested. What I believe happens, and public health has always talked about poverty causing ill health. Poverty is as likely to be a consequence of ill health. And what we're seeing is a cycle of alienation that has happened in West Central Scotland that started off maybe with chaotic early years, Children who experience chaotic early years have mental health problems when they go to school, behavior difficulties, which often lead to them being excluded from school, a policy that alienates them even more. I was speaking at a school in Glasgow recently where a teacher told me about a boy who was persistently truanting from school. So the school's response to that was to exclude him. <laughs> 
Does that make sense? That leads to failure in education. These kids are far more likely to end up going to jail. That leads to loss of self-efficacy, loss of sense of control, loss of self-esteem, worklessness, poverty. And when I talk to the boys in Pullman and ask them what they're going to do when they leave, the response is always the same. I'll never get a job, so I'll just sit at home. I'll watch telly and I'll drink. What they never say to me is, I'll have a couple of kids as well. And the cycle is handed on from chaotic parent to child who becomes chaotic. So we need to break that cycle. And we've decided in Scotland to break the cycle by doing something about early years. And doing something different. Not having a governmental policy. Or having a governmental policy where the policy is let the system design the change. And it's based on this idea of marginal gains. Okay, Britain got the best track cycling team in the world through paying attention to lots of small details. The aerodynamics of the skin suits, the width of the, the pedals, the bottom bracket, the, all sorts of small details add up to big changes. And the conventional way of doing things would be to get some experts in a room, have a civil servant collect the minutes of their discussions, they talk for six months, they hand a, 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 a report to the, the, the minister, who then, if he approves it, it gets sent out as policy. And then, of course, nothing much happens. And nothing much happens for that reason. Because you can't expect frontline workers to be committed to a policy that they've had no say in shaping. How many times have you heard someone say, what do these folk know? They want to come out here and work with me and then they'll see what life is really like. I work with it. And my wife's a GP, so I hear that all the time. So what we decided to do and what government, what ministers decided to do was to turn that on its head. Get the front line to design the change and test the changes. And things that worked, tell everyone about it. And things that didn't work, tell everyone about it. And then gradually, across the whole system in Scotland, we would learn what worked. This is the Early Years Collaborative in Action. That's the last permanent secretary. He came to all the meetings. You can see he looks suitably relaxed. John Swinney, our finance minister, came to one meeting to deliver a 20-minute speech. He stayed for five hours. Civil servants were going crazy with him because they had to change his whole diary, but he left proclaiming it the most important piece of public sector reform he had ever seen because it was happening from the bottom up. And the kind of outcomes that we've seen, for example, a 15% reduction in infant mortality. That's stillbirth rate, a 15% reduction in stillbirths. And the next thing we'll see will be an increase in, or rather a decrease in the number of children with developmental problems at age three. Because people are working on that just now. And then after that, it'll be fewer children arriving at school with developmental problems. So I won't go into detail about how that is achieved. Is Donna Bell in the room? Donna, Donna, not here. All right, okay. Donna was critical in the development of uh, the Early Years Collaborative, and she's now moved on to a Raising Attainment for All Collaborative, taking these small changes ideas into the 8 to 18 age range. And therefore, we have a method in Scotland that is radically different, that is producing profound changes in the pattern of early life in Scotland. And we need to keep that going. I'll just finish with a couple of quotes. First one being from this guy. Many of the Scots in the room will know who he is. The international guests won't. He was a communist shop steward in Glasgow in 1970 when the Conservative government wanted to close all the shipyards in, in Glasgow. And he stopped them doing it, not by taking the workers out on strike, but by taking them into work. They went into the shipyards, they locked the gates, and they continued to build ships for weeks 
And eventually the government had to back down because he was such a tremendous speaker. And he was on the news every night telling the government what they should do. The ancient Scottish universities have a post as Lord Rector. The head of the university is elected by the students in the, the old Scottish universities. Glasgow University is 564 years old. I was a medical student in 1971 when we elected this guy Lord Rector of Glasgow University. His rectorial speech was reprinted in full in the New York Times, which called it the single most important public speech since the Gettysburg Address. And those of us who were there thought that comparison with Abraham Lincoln was hugely flattering to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> it was about alienation, which he defined as the cry of men who feel themselves the victims of blind economic forces beyond their control. The feeling of despair and hopelessness that pervades people who feel with justification they have no say in shaping or determining their own ends, their own destinies. They are excluded from the processes of decision-making. What we have seen over the past 30 or 40 years in Scotland, I would predict we will see over the next 30 or 40 years in Greece because people, not just in Greece, but across a whole range of countries in Europe, have no say in shaping or determining their own destinies. And what we will see will be an erosion of well-being in those countries, those parts of Europe. Another guy I like very much is this chap, Catholic priest who 30 years ago was sent to a parish in South Los Angeles where LAPD told him he'd be lucky to survive the week because the place was riven with gang warfare. Latino gangs were out there shooting anybody that moved. 30 years on, he has helped literally thousands of these guys get jobs and put meaning and purpose into their life. Those are some of his friends there. He started a thing called Homeboy Industries. He got this guy who is a film producer to buy him a disused bakery. And he comes to Glasgow uh, fairly frequently. He was over a couple of weeks ago on his way to Geneva to speak at a, a, a UN meeting. And you, this is one of the points he makes. This is one of the things that he said the last time he was over that really hit me. What we need is compassion that stands in awe at the burdens the poor have to carry rather than one that stands in judgment at the way they carry them. We can have lots of scientific argument. We can have lots of, you know, Jimmy Reid understood what was happening in Scotland in the 1970s. All I've been able to do is put scientific underpinning to the consequences of that. We need to be moved by concern, compassion, and care for people and young children and their parents who find themselves with unimaginable difficulties, difficulties that we've been fortunate to avoid. But we need to understand how we can help them best. And actually, a few hugs would go down quite well. So my argument, my injunction to you is to be brave. Get your feet wet. Try new things. Try difficult things. Get involved with what's happening with early years and raising attainment for all collaborative. Really get to grips with this. But above all, while you're being brave and trying new things and, and being man enough, being brave enough to fail, but tell people about it, while you're being brave, don't forget the hugs. Thanks very much. <laughs>